Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Double Feature Podcast, where every week, me and my boy David bring two movies together. We try and find a way to kill a weekend, the best movie marathon, the best double feature. David, how are you doing? I can feel the kid inside of me, Dean. I'm really excited for this month, uh, new month, new themed month that we're doing like we've done every month this year, already halfway through the year, too, which is kind of scary. It's a little crazy, yeah. Yeah, uh, life just flies by when you're wasting your time on film. But uh, this week we're doing a little bit more than just watching films. We can drop that pretentious word into the garbage because this week we're, or the, and this month rather, we're, we're focusing on cartoons. Yes. For the month of June, we are focusing on cartoons. Cartoon June, as it were. And this week, for the first time, we're getting a little bit more personal with our picks. Because, oddly enough, me and David share something in common. Our favorite animated films of all time come from Warner Brothers Studios. And David, what was your what was your film you brought to the table? You know, this wasn't really my favorite from when I was a kid so much as like later in life I grew to appreciate this one a lot more. That being Cats Don't Dance, a kind of underrated uh, musical movie from 1990 and, good question. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be a seven? I'm going with a yeah. seven. 1997, good call. Uh, the movie follows a cartoon cat that goes to Hollywood, trying to chase the big dreams. It's all kind of a spoof of those 1920s, 1930s Hollywood films. I mean, whenever I watch this, it's it has a it has an atmosphere to it that just really brings out the the perfect feelings that you should get when watching this kind of movie. And especially, it's like Dean said, nice that it's only seventy five minutes long, quick and brisk. It, it's it's pretty clean. It's a pretty clean cut movie. Yeah, I believe last on last week's episode, I described this as a movie I would stop and watch at any moment if it were to come up on TV. And I think I will feel that way for the rest of my life. Oh, and that's a good that's a good feeling to have. Because my pick, the one that I brought to the table, is the favorite from childhood. Probably a lot of people's favorite. I feel I'm I'm like I'm not gonna surprise anybody. Like my favorite animated film kids movie is The Iron Giant. Um this mm -hmm. movie to this day. I am a grown ass man. I have a full time job. Like I have a car. This movie makes me like a seven year old kid sitting in my den at night all over again. I I cannot watch the ending of this film without tearing up to this day. And I don't think a day will come where I won't. This this movie is on just the right line of hitting you, hitting you in the feels and just taking you back as a kid it is just mwah, chef's kiss it, it's one of those movies where for me it's like a really like emotional like personal experience that it's hard to describe but i i love this movie a lot of people i've that have watched this movie and it's been their favorite always describe it singly because of that final moment making them cry so i i think that's a apt way to describe it um yeah, so the, a couple, both these movies are being uh, Warner Brothers films, not Disney films, because you know we're not Disney adults, Dean. No, no, uh, it's... I, nah. Don't get me wrong. I I remember the Disney Channel growing up. I remember the Disney, you know, cult of personality. But I think I think there's a big difference between being a Disney Channel f fan, which was you know it's it, it's like watching Nickelodeon when you were a kid. It's yeah. There's a, there's a special time and a special place for it. It's a totally different thing, especially me. I live in Orange County, so I I'm surrounded by these people. The Disney adult is well. There should probably be a home for them somewhere, and of course that unfortunately is a hundred and fifty dollars for a day ticket, and it's 
right down the street. But you know, you know, uh, yeah. Thankfully, there's other studios that make animated films. Warner Brothers being one that made some really great ones in the '90s that, like you were kind of alluding to before, didn't get quite as much love at the box office. Uh, but neither of these films really did. I think Iron Giant was a little bit more successful. Yeah, and this is um, so. I guess we'll we'll get into the introduction of these two films a little bit, or at least the backstory around them. So yeah, as you were saying, what happens is the Iron Giant it makes like thirteen or th- it makes like thirty something million dollars at the box office against a ninety million dollar budget, hmm. or maybe or a very large budget, and Cats Don't Dance makes like a six million dollar budget at the box office and the cost of this movie was somewhere in like the the 30 million dollars both these movies were considered complete financial failures and basically just disappeared into the ether um thanks to the home video marketing that's basically the only reason these movies like survived in like consciousness of people um and the reason being is for those who don't know about this um Warner Brothers and like Time Warner were bought out by AOL at like the end of the 90s. Um, actually, the whole deal spanned from oddly enough 1997 to about 1999 because when you buy something that big, a lot of shit it takes a long time to finalize where stuff goes. Yeah, I mean, so, we're honestly you know. because of current events kind of just seeing the final versions of that with Disney and Fox. Yeah, actually, now that you mention it. Because it, it's crazy because, what is it, Fox sold all of their backlog to Disney, right? But they didn't sell, like, The Simpsons and Fox News. That was, like, the only thing they didn't sell over. Yeah. Or they sell, the, like, The Simpsons and all that animation block stuff. I think, so basically, when a lot of this stuff happens, I, there's it's never a clean cut. You don't always acquire the whole of a company because it might cost too much or you might not have any reason like what reason would disney have to buy fox news um good point especially when they already own abc it's like it doesn't make much sense so what they probably do are looking to do is buy things like the simpsons the marvel properties those kinds of things um which they do acquire but yeah then there are certain parts of that that are auctioned off to different ones are still part of the fox corporation it's 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 tough (laughs) it's it's but you know it's probably it's it's unfortunate because then you get things like cer- certain things like Fox Searchlight, which are now disbanded technically. Um, yeah, well, that happened with um, Disney because they owned Hollywood Pictures, and then yeah. Hollywood Pictures went defunct after Stay Alive. I think was the last movie that came out with them, and that was the studio that did like The Rocketeer, Camp Nowhere. It was Disney's kind of like, oh, we can make like teen plus style films. Hmm. And when that went under, Disney... I don't think Disney lost any money when Hollywood Studios went under. Or Hollywood Pictures went under. No, it just, probably they not. They just stopped making money. Yeah, and that's... You know, that speaks to the level of conglomerate that Disney is, where they can just kind of have a failing part of their company that they're just like, well, eh, don't need it anymore. Um, but, thankfully, you know, on the opposite side of that, when studios are financially we'll say competitive it it does breed some creativity which we get out of both of these movies that have you know i at least uh, i i didn't do a a little bit of research on um, the iron giants production but cats out dance has a very interesting production history that i'd like to get into but you know i before we i guess go further and further into the histories and productions and um what makes these films so great why don't we Mm -hmm dig into the little previews, the log lines, and we'll we'll get this thing rolling. That's about what we plan to do. David, give us the elevator pitches for these movies. Right, the log lines for this week. Cats Don't Dance is about a country cat that buys a ticket to chase his dreams in Tinseltown, despite the logos uh, local smoggy pessimism because of the star brat. The Iron Giant is about a latchkey boy that bonds with a giant mechanical beast 
as the man in black seeks to find the massive weapon and take it in. Ah, wonderful. And you did that in just the right order, because I watched Cat- Cats Don't Dance first into Iron Giant. Mm, that is what I did as well, so I guess that kind of solves our issue. It's true. I, I think that's probably works the best, right? Because if you watch... Like, I don't think you're going to want to watch anything after Iron Giant, because, like, either your en- the ending is going to get to you, or you're just going to be like, I'm, I'm fucking done with humanity, I'm done with everything, I just need to lay down. Yeah, you know. So that's like maybe like jazz to like watch movies. Yeah, I I agree. You know, I think it's been a while since we've actually talked the logistics of a double feature and what makes a good one. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think I agree. The 75 minute kind of appetizer that is Cats Don't Dance works really well because the palette gets you totally excited for everything that goes on in movies. Cats Don't Dance was was also kind of one of those movies that inspired, I don't want to say inspired me to be a filmmaker, but like. It gets the juices flowing, like you said, and it, it really helps. And then, yeah, the Iron Giant opposite of that is a quite dramatic story that, uh, you know, is is great in its own respects as a kid film, but almost even gets to the point where I'm like, this is this could be more for the parents than for the kids. This, yeah, and it's and it's fascinating, right? Mm. Like how these movies kind of like where their target audiences lie. And it's just fascinating the tone they're both going for. Because these are, like, in reality, these are opposite ends of the spectrum. In terms of, like, tone, story, style, all that stuff. But they both kind of work, right? They both kind of work together. Yeah, I think that they do benefit from being from the same studio. I think Warner mm-hmm. Brothers, you know, one of my favorites that was just rebooted is um, The Animaniacs. Which is a Steven Spielberg brainchild. Yeah. And I feel like mm-hmm. that's what these movies kind of have. They have a little bit of that, like, that film of a, uh, and I mean film rather in residue rather than stock. Um, yeah. That film of a Spielberg kind of golden hour. There's wonder in the world, kind of, kind of feel to him. Um, yeah. I guess that's it's the end of my thought, but yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. I'll give you that. But yeah, so I guess we kind of solved our own issue. So yeah, let's let's just get into cats don't dance, David. Seventy-five minutes of bright colors and music. Ah uh, yes, nothing like it. Um, I love this movie. I mean, it's the perfect kind of not quite a hero's journey, but it's still taking on some elements of that of the boy who's on a rock that wants to go chase bigger things. Uh, it's a musical, which is I think quite a beautiful one i think some of the the pieces of music in this movie are some of the best i've ever heard in a musical i mean uh, i'll i'll give you that the music is interesting i liked the the movement and the dancing done in like the characters because i found out gene kelly um did the choreography for all the animal actors or all the animals in the in the film he instructed them how like they should move as like actual dancers i thought that was fascinating yeah, and quite fitting because it kind of has that singing in the rain feel to it. Um, yeah, I mean, the, okay, actually, let's start there because I think it's a good point. Uh, now they brought out that factoid. One of the, my favorite parts about this is this movie, it deals in that kind of anamorphic animation. It's that humanoid, but we're animals kind of thing, which is important mm-hmm. to the theme, but I think that thing it's quite overdone that in the current uh, era that being late 2010s to early 2020s which feels weird to list off as a decade um, yeah. we're, we're again in the roaring 20s again um, you know if there's a lot of that going on nowadays we have a lot of popular animated projects that deal with animated animals but it, it's always kind of how should I how should I put it I feel like because especially because every animated film is 3D nowadays, I feel like all animation ends up looking the same. Yeah, I can I can kind of see where you're getting at, and I guess that goes to the argument that it used to be like animated films or films that came out of certain studios were very like unique because these things had to be hand drawn. Yeah, like the the physical artists had to like create like these characters, and I I will admit that certain 
animated films now just seem very generic. There, there's like one of them. I, it was like, oh, I remember it was Zoo, like Zootopia, mm-hmm. and Sing. I think was the the movie. I do remember that one. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's about the I, singing contest where and a bunch of farm animals or something like that. It's kind of like yeah. um, done to the musical stylings of like a Rent or something like that. It's like Amer- yeah, it's like American Idol for animals, and it's weird. <laughs> But I don't I don't know if they were made by the same studio. I but think if you if you put a still of those movies next to each other, I could not tell you which one they're from. That's certainly they, true. They look identical. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting uh, observation because one of those I know is DreamWorks. I think seeing being from DreamWorks and their their most popular ones are coming nowadays from the studio that is responsible for for the economic boom and mimic disaster that is despicable me uh you know i think it's like anim animation studio or something like that um and then zootopia i know is a disney movie opposite of that but you kind of make a point in that zootopia was a very interesting movie don't get me wrong i think i think that was one where it's like it kind of gets the whole we should make this for families and make it so that the the parents and the family can kind of get into the world and then the kids mm-hmm. can kind of still get into the movie as a whole because that, that it, it, that's what both of these movies do Iron Giant and Cats Don't Dance is there's a world that the parents can get into and understand but the, it's still a kids movie yeah. but you're certainly right in that I do feel like the we'll call it generic animation that is pretty much making things bouncy uh I'm not gonna lie. Some of the 3D animation nowadays is a little stiff. It doesn't master the fluidity of. Well, I'm like gonna traditional say, animation. I was gonna say even just cats don't dance because one of the things I I really like about this movie is that movements are fluid, but even can be soft in certain ways. Yeah, honestly, that's something interesting about cats don't dance is that everything in the in the film is incredibly fluid and that goes to the fact that it's it's a dancing and singing musical it's cast on dance is really harkening back to like big like 1940s 1950s you know backstage musicals right Mm -hmm. um something almost kind of in the vein of like gold diggers of 1935 like those kind of films exact same thing yeah yeah where it's it's a movie and it's about show business and these are the stories of all the little people who go into making show business work. The little and people. And their dreams and desires. Yeah, the little people. <laughs> the little animals. The little cute little animals. And, like, the fluidity of how, like, Danny moves and how Sawyer moves and how all the characters move in the dance sequences and all these other things is really just, like, impressive to see. Knowing that this was a traditionally animated film. This was actually the last traditionally animated films out of like Warner Brothers like film studios where it was all done by hand right like that's what traditional animation is is it's somebody's physically drawing on a cell and putting it together Iron Giant technically is traditionally animated but the giant itself is is a CGI robot which like basically makes it so it doesn't count which is weird but yeah um but yeah. yeah so it, it's yes sir no i was disagreeing yes always agree with me you know please my ego needs it no. but yeah i think cast on dance is just kind of fascinating looking at it now backwards is that it just doesn't look like anything now like the characters don't look but like something you would see in a cartoon now right no i i, I can't think of one i mean Pixar, thankfully, is, is as we'll talk about next episode, uh, it's been fortunate to see that they've done a lot of good things technically with animation that mm-hmm. takes that to certain places that, well, maybe it doesn't come back and get like the kind of really nice, comforting 2D animation style that we get that's warm or cinematic. I think that's one way I would use to describe it, although that's probably generically boring. Uh, of a word to use but yeah like uh, you know you made a good point too because I do 
I think it's interesting to highlight this bit of anime uh, uh, history. Uh, DreamWorks animation kind of, again, goes on to be the next big thing in that bit you mentioned about 3D animation taking over. I believe, if I can find a list here, that Shrek is the next thing, which is a weird thing to think about. <laughs> well, if we wanted to go with, like, animated films that changed how animation, like, was dog, it's like... Like Toy Story, like yeah. blew up and just just it's like this is what we're doing now. Like filmmaking is different, and then it was like Shrek came out and became the and it turned out it was like oh DreamWorks is the only thing that could threaten Disney's market share of your childhood, and then it turned out it was only Shrek that could challenge the market share of your childhood. If I'm being real here, <laughs> well, you're not wrong there. Well, I, you know, I guess I saw revolution. Yeah, yeah. I guess I was I was speaking more in terms of like non Disney, which Toy Story was technically not Disney when it came out. Um, yeah. Not like non Disney wise, uh, yeah. Like I guess Shrek would be the next one, and probably like you said, the only one for a while because DreamWorks is kind of on a um, uh, more of a hot streak now. They have a couple franchises: Despicable Me, Hotel Transylvania. Uh, they had what cloud with a chance of meatballs i know it was a big one yeah i think that pets one had a couple mm -hmm. um but you know they're, they're yeah uh yeah <laughs> you know i mean i neither here nor there let's get back to the to the star of the show as we'll say yeah yeah so, because so, it's about stars exactly uh we talked about that animation and now let's get to that music because that's one of the reasons I come back to this movie and over, over and over are the tracks mm -hmm. that I hear. Yeah, like, I get it. Musicals and maybe even these kind of show tunes aren't for everybody. But, I mean, I, I just can't get over so the emotion that they instill to a kid's movie. That's what impresses me, is that even for a movie that's made for eight-year-olds, they make it with the intention of moving you. I mean, uh, something like Tell Me Lies... You can't tell me that doesn't kind of get you. Oh, okay. So, like, I'm I'm be real. I haven't seen this movie in like literal decades, right? I was probably in that eight year old bracket last time I saw this movie. And then I watched it now, and I was watching it. And I'm like, I kind of remember the characters. Okay, this looks vaguely familiar. And then when she got to like the the lie to me song. Okay, like mm. suddenly I everything flooded back. Like like that song hit and everything came back and I was like eight years old again at my grandma's house. It was like that and like big and loud. Those two songs, I was like, Oh, okay, now I recognize this. And I think those two are some of the best songs in the movie. Oh yeah, I mean those two and then I guess the the very first one, um, when he arrives in town which if I can find the track list, I can probably read it. We can properly it. credit these? Yeah, because I could just go off and sing some lyrics from it, but I don't think that would be at all appropriate. Um, <laughs> you, you just don't want people to know you were in a band. I know it. Yeah, uh, I think it's just called Danny's Arrival Song. Okay. Well, yeah. Yeah, the, like those, I, I do think that Nothing's Gonna Stop Us Now at the end is a little show stoppy for my taste, but... Because it, the the other the other tracks of what I like about it is they they take that instrumentation from the time, whereas nothing's gonna stop us now is very much. We're trying to wrap this shit up. <laughs> so <laughs> it's the thing where it's like the director came and was like, "Hey guys, so this is the this is the ending of the movie. Uh, I need something, I need something to send send the family home happy. Go big, just just wrap it up. It needs to be about a five to ten minute song." Because it's gonna have to play through the credits. Yeah, and I think it's actually a pretty good song. If I'm if I'm being real, like I think though, because the music in the in the film it's very like aimed at like young kids, but it's definitely taking cues from like older musicals and older like music stylings. Like there's like kind of like like jazzy tap dancey kind of kind of style to some of the music. Mm. But the three songs that are really like. Okay, so I think Big and Loud is good because personally I think 
in every animated film, the villain song is the best song. Yeah. And Big and Loud, I think, is good just because it just it tells a story. It lets you know about the character, and it's used in like a subversive way. And also, it's just a really interesting, bombastically loud like musical number. Uh, Lie to Me is just like beautifully animated and it's a beautifully done song uh, with the when it has the dissolves on it oh my oh, god yeah. get out of town yeah it's it's like just a beautiful combination of like like vocal performance like regular performance for like the actress and like how the animation works with it it's a very beautifully done song mm. and then nothing's gonna stop us now is like okay this is the one that I'm gonna hum for like like two days afterwards because i'm like that's just it's a catchy earworm and it's just it's it's a nice song you know yeah tucks at your heartstrings if you like old musicals you're gonna like nothing's gonna stop us now because that that sounds like something that could be in like singing in the rain or um any other like old musical like yeah because i'm pretty sure like my sister did nothing's gonna stop us now for like a play when she was like in high school. Oh, how fun! Yeah, she uh, did a lot of theater. Yeah, uh, and then there's also that Randy Newman song. Anyways, uh, <laughs> then there's also Randy Newman. Whatever, we'll get to him next week. It's unfortunate that that's the one that won an award. Uh, I it won an Annie Award for music in a feature production, aside from the score, which should have won by Steve Goldstein. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I mean, so there there is that, all of that going on. Um, you mentioned actually another point I want to bring up about this movie and the villain of this movie. But uh, by and large, the characters, but specifically our villain, is mm -hmm. just fantastic. This is another thing I think that they just nailed down about the movie is making sure all the characters are full of life. And nobody is more full of life than Darla Temple. I mean, okay, I think the reason you like Darla Dimple is because she is explicitly a rip on, like, Shirley Temple and the old-style, like, studio dynamic, and it's very interesting to see this very small character who has such a very big personality and who is just absolutely just cruel. Because she's not, like, evil, she's very cruel. And all my favorite is Max, her like henchman. That's oh, the yeah. size. The that's the size of a truck. Yeah, I, a lot of people do list Max. I just think like what I enjoy so much because Max is great. No, not well, Max. I like Max because he looks like the butler from um, Sunset Boulevard. That's true. I I think that's interesting. Is there's a lot of little things in this movie that are just like references to like old old movies that you wouldn't get. Exactly. Right. Yeah. I think I think you're totally right, and I think that's kind of why I really enjoy the depth to the villain in this movie. Darla Dimple, yeah, she's on the surface, Shirley Temple, but then, like you said, there's a little bit of that like Sunset Boulevard blind selfishness. The faces that she makes are just like beyond twisted. I mean, it's so good. And, that, and the fact that I think she's good for some of the best laughs in the movie just because of, like, the raw anger. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I really do think that she's a... Because think about this, too. When the movie is kind of about just animals versus a kid, mm -hmm. like, how do you really make that work? I think it ends up becoming kind of this um, even more interesting thing because... How should I put it? Darla Dimple is like, of course she's going to be a brat. You know, that's the stereotype anyways. I think it becomes even, well, maybe I'm just repeating myself, but, you know, you, you get what I mean. There's a lot going on here. There's a lot of depth yeah. to her. Um, I, I mean, I, I hesitate to call it depth, but there's a lot to the character that works as a villain for this kind of movie. Yeah. Like... I just think I don't it's know like, that much about her. I guess is is what I'm saying. Like, I, there's not a lot I confer about her other than, like, I, there's not a lot I confer about her past, her personality, and her like emotional range. But she's very good in the role that she's put into. Yeah, 
I just think it's like the perfect. It, it's I think it's just execution for me, where it's like the the wheels are greased on the performance. The animation's fantastic for it. The it it could have been an evil producer. It could have been just a rip off of Sunset Boulevard. It could have been a lot of things, but distilling it into kind of this falsely innocent character really makes the story pop in a certain way. Because it's all about you know, in this kind of digging into the final point about the themes of the movie, the story is all about Danny coming to town and realizing Hollywood's not at all it's cracked up to be. And what better way to do that than to personify the false you know, fairy tale that is Tinseltown in uh, Darla Dimple. Um, Which works perfectly making her a Shirley Temple ripoff because, yeah. you know, Shirley Temple is one of those, like, iconic Hollywood, like, faces or characters or, you know, per- Hollywood personas, right, that you associate with, like, that golden age of Hollywood because it's, like, she was the biggest child star for, like, decades in oh, yeah. decades. Ironically, next week, uh, presented an award to one of the films we're watching. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, so I, I think it's one of those things where it's just all the, the, the pins on the, the board come together, like, perfectly. They There's not, like, a loose end, I think, in the execution here. Yeah, You know, it, getting a little bit into this, um, this cynicism and talking about another character that I love in this movie... Sawyer and kind of the overall cynicism that the movie is not afraid to dive into. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, that's, that's I think, one of the reasons why I really enjoy this movie as an adult. Because Sawyer is a very adult character for a kid's movie. Yeah. But... She, she is every, like, actress who came to town and realized that it doesn't matter how talented you are, it matters, like, who you know. And becoming very jaded by it. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of a... um, Kind of a a more... Charismatic version of Saunders from Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Different Mm -hmm. city, different story, of course, but it's the same thing. You know, she's a cynical secretary, dreams are dashed. um, But then also that she really becomes one of, like, the most emotionally captivating characters in the movie because i will say danny how should i describe (laughs) it is hard for me to deal with danny's extra optimism for this long yeah i'm not that's what i'm gonna go with it's probably good that the movie is 75 minutes because of that but you can't help but still like danny it's just that sawyer is really where you get them the emotional connection from Um, Because I think we all identify more with her and Danny's kind of that guiding hand. I I would almost almost argue that Sawyer is more of a main character in my eyes, but that's more opinion than it is technical. Well, actually, she goes through the arc in the film. Yeah, exactly. She goes from being like this jaded character to kind of like, well, you know, there's no hope in Hollywood for people like us, to being like, well, with this guy, he's so optimistic, I'll give it a shot. Well, his dreams are dashed, but it's, you know, it doesn't really hurt to dream. And then she kind of comes back around to being like, you know what? Dreams are worth chasing, even if they're, even if they're hard to attain. And then at the end of the movie, she's like, dreams is everybody, blah, blah, blah. Like, she goes to the actual arc. Danny is, from the beginning of the movie to the end of the movie, I don't think he changes. Right? Like, he doesn't go through an arc. He's, He's the character, he's the agent of change in the film. And everyone around him changes because of him. But he doesn't change himself. It's interesting. Yeah. He, at most, might stand up to the challenges of the film. And I think that's one of the the things about this movie that is probably a good writing lesson to take away, if there is one. Um, Mm -hmm. Because there's going to be another one I'll, I'll cite for Iron Giant later. Sometimes the buddy movie is the perfect way to split your main character into two people if you if you find that you're having trouble with it because one of them could be the person who compels or, or uh, tackles the physical obstacles in the movie that being Danny and the other person could be the one who responds to all of the moments of change which ideally like a protagonist should do in one type character but sometimes it's best to kind of split that up and see what happens um so a final point I guess we can make before moving on 
Uh, this movie is often noted for having the kind of general theme of the movie being about discrimination and racism at that time in Hollywood, which I've always found to be one of the most fascinating things about this movie. And I, 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 I don't want to get what you think about that necessarily, but like, what, what did you think when you were watching the movie and that those kinds of things came up? Because, you know, we're dealing with animals don't belong in Hollywood films at a time when racism was pretty rampant in Hollywood. It's not explicitly stated, but it's an interesting bit. Well, like, I understood the the -the on-the-surface concept of, like, this movie is about how discrimination, yada, 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 and it's using the guise of, like, animals in in the eyes of, like, atypical Hollywood actors, right? Actors who were, you know, you're not right for the role for X, Y, or Z reason, and like I, I I think it's just the thing we're looking at it I got it that this is a story about like discrimination I didn't really see it as a thing about like race and that might just be a thing where like I picked up on the on the dream aspect of it because the, the very light hearted like thematic thing of the characters because a lot of it is the characters that we meet in Hollywood are jaded, their dreams have been dashed because, you know, they couldn't get a real gig in the studio system because they were for for they were animals, they were atypical they were atypical actors looking, yada yada yada. Or like just not they're not in the ra- the hum- they're not in the human race. They're the animal race, and animals don't become stars in pictures. Which is, you know, where you get that guy's racism but i looked at it more of like don't give up on your dreams even if they're hard or impossible just if you try 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 you can get there hope is what you need in this really jaded and hard world and i think it's a fascinating thing because the movie does have multiple things it's talking about and the mess i think it's the thing where i'm looking at the messaging of the movie more as the thematic thing it's it's tackling i you and know it's, and it's interesting i i think i totally agree with you i was i guess i wanted to bring up the question because it's kind of one of those glaring things that people talk about surrounding this movie but i, I think yeah. I, to- I i pretty much agree with your analysis on it because i think there's key things inside the movie itself that should make it extend beyond just maybe that kind of surface level inspiration of the historical time that it's mimicking but you know we have things like elephants who play piano something that technically is an oxymoron because how are you going to get those giant hooves to press tiny keys yeah so i think it's in my mind kind of that that whole in crowd versus the out crowd thing uh where people often look at hollywood as something you have to break into And then if you're already in, you're part of the family. Well, I think that's just what's going on here is like there are outsiders, there are insiders, and there's a reason you're on the outside. But when you break into the inside, something magical happens. Of course, Mm -hmm. there's the other side of that Hollywood thing where once you're inside, you become part of the animal. But that's, I think, a different different story. That's a a story for the sequel. That's Cats Don't Rehab, you know, the the, the 2002 sequel that... (laughs) <laughs> the, the 2002 sequel done by like Ralph Baskey and it's all about like heroin yeah script, uh, script written by uh, Darren Aronofsky I w- <laughs> I would watch the fuck out of that movie oh my god that uh, yeah, movie dude. would be a banger and the, the score is done by uh, Trent Reznor yeah there we go <laughs> oh man could could we do we have a time machine? I need to go back to two thousand two to make this movie happen. Yeah, well, Ugh. in layman's terms, uh, great movie, fantastic score, lovely animation. I think you know so so as to put it, since we're talking about animals, that's enough of beating the dead horse. Um, I mean, I have a dissenting opinion, but you mm. know. I'll save that for the end so I can get through the next half of the discussion without hating you. Of course, of course. You know, because again, you're attacking my childhood when you you attack this movie. Uh, 
let's go ahead and attack your childhood. I mean, there's not going to be much of an attack. Um, better, better fucking not be, dog. No, I mean, yeah. what's up? <laughs> I'm about to get real ghetto on you. All right. Oh, I think so. We'll find a way to in the Iron Giant, mm-hmm. which will be coming up next. Right after this. Dean, I found a great way for us to do something cool and to make a little money on the side. Oh, great. I've been looking for a new place to put my money. What do you got? No investment needed. In fact, it's super easy, and there's creation tools we can use to record our podcast right from the phone or computer. Wait, why would you record a podcast on your phone? You want, no, Never mind, never mind. Where do I put my money for this? Uh, I don't need any of your money. Uh, we can even get our podcast distributed to big streaming platforms like Spotify and Google Podcasts. Oh, I get it now. I get it now. We're talking big business here, okay? So you're going to need a lot of money from me. How much money are we talking here? No, nope, no, nope, definitely don't need any of your money. In fact, we can make money from the podcast with no minimum listenership. Okay, now I think I'm getting what you're going at here. We need to spend money to make money. So we're, we're talking some big gains here. Big gains. No, no, definitely. No, I don't need any of your money. So all we need to make a podcast right in one place. Okay, okay. So what you're telling me is that you're going to need a pretty big check from me for this podcast. So do I just make it out to cash? Because it's no problem for me. I'll just you know write it up right now. No, listen, Dean, just head over to anchor.fm and check it out. You'll see why Anchor is the best place for us to record, edit, and distribute our podcasts. And I definitely do not need any of your money. Shut up and take my money. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to part two of our double feature here on the Double Feature Podcast. And on this second half, we're talking about the Iron Giant. So, David, like, the fucking, this movie, (laughs) this movie is a masterpiece. It, it, I, I have said this about a lot of movies, and I have been wrong a lot of times, because this is the actual perfect movie. You know, I, I would say so. I think this is, has some great minds behind it. Um, directed by Brad Bird, who would go on to do a whole bunch of other animated films that are pretty damn good. The, he's the responsible for the Incredibles. He's responsible. I think he's responsible for like ninety percent of the Pixar films in some way or another. And this is his directorial debut. This is the first film he made, and he has, um, as stated, he had complete creative control over the film, which is fascinating. Yeah, it is kind of fascinating. Um, he, like to your point did do The Incredibles. I think he did Ratatouille as well. Um, he is responsible for Tomorrowland? Eh, you know, it happens. But he but did so, at least do an a Mission Impossible movie, which I think is an interesting stop on his director uh, journey. I mean, yeah. Ghost Protocol, though? He did Ghost Protocol, though. That's, that's, that's a pretty good one. You know, he's also responsible for do the Bartman. If you're if you're interesting, <laughs> you know, he he is responsible for giving that to the world. That's fair. But yeah, so, but besides the fact that Brad Burr gave uh, you know a lot of people their childhood, so the Iron Giant, like, where where do you want to get started? Because I think with um, Cats Out Dance, we got started with the animation of of the film and cats don't dance is very cartoony right like characters are elastic characters move around and there's a lot of like chaotic movement and in this it's very not that it's almost like in the king of the hill vein of animation where everything is basically realistic yeah i think it kind of tackles the way i would describe it is like the movie is very dramatic so i think they needed to to inject a little realism in order to make it a little bit more physically effective. Um, Because, yeah, you could make it cartoonish and elastic, like you were saying, but I think it would take a little bit of the oomph out of what we're trying to accomplish here, especially because I think... I mean, this is one of the most, like, deep and interesting stories to ever come across a 
an animated film, a kids film in general, even. I would I would put this up there as being one of those films like E. T. where it's like it has no place being a kid's story, but goddamn is it that good. Yeah. It is it is kind of fascinating the the tone about this movie, right? So I've always like looked back on this film thinking that okay, this is a movie and it's designed for kids. It's the devi- it's designed for kids in the like five to ten year old bracket they watch it between the ages of five and ten they like it and then they never watch it again mm. but looking at this now as an adult i'm having the realization that no this is just a very good movie with a child protagonist and it's just designed as an animated film right like this this feels like a film that that works as just a normal movie right like you don't have to put the guise of it's a kids film so you give it like the handicap on like the 18th hole to get it across the finish line yeah it just works as a good movie i think and i think that's why i think i like it liken it to et because et had it was a cultural phenomenon at the time that people of all ages were able to get behind unfortunately yeah. the iron giant was a quite a cultural phenomenon for some reason i mean this film has pretty much everything that that movie has it has a buddy story that Mm -hmm. is about a friendship that is being pressured by the government and (laughs) the man in black in particular yeah uh, that also deals heavily in adult skepticism it's also about like you know humanity what makes people like human what's what is your purpose in life if you don't know where you're from and all this other stuff it's deals in like existentialism and humanism and all this other stuff but it had one thing that E.T. had that Iron Giant did not, and that was a marketing budget. This That's movie got no true. marketing budget. Yeah. I I found out that Brad Bird, the biggest thing Brad Bird was angry about was that it, he didn't get his Burger King tie-in for the movie. This movie was supposed to have, like, a Burger King tie-in with, he did, like, toys, and it was going to be the big advertisement push for the movie, and he didn't get it. So they only started advertising this movie like a week before it got released and it ran for like whatever and then it stopped. So no one saw this in theaters. I will never ever 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 understand why producers can go into like the marketing phase of a film and say, mm, we'll wait. <laughs> like when is that? Or, there's actually it's interesting enough. Been some Disney films that that's happened to recently. Mm-hmm. You may or probably may not have heard of Raya and the Last Dragon, which was a recent Disney re- release. It's one of their most recent animated films. That look on your face kind of looks like you haven't heard of it. I have no idea what you're talking about. But it's literally their biggest release this year. It's it's another Disney princess film. It's supposed to take place the place of Mulan as like the the Asian market Disney princess. Mm-hmm. Because Nobody... a lot of people had negative reactions to the Mulan movie. Yeah, probably the negative reactions to the live action Mulan movie. Although the original Mulan is a great movie. I love the original Mulan. Yeah, like that movie is actually good. I think that's better than the Little Mermaid. It really. It, I don't know. I, I I I can't explain to you what Disney is thinking, but. Nonetheless, they did not market for Rhea very much. Partially, yeah, because COVID probably stopped their uh, their traditional marketing strategy of getting people to buy tickets at the box office. But when when you can literally get people inside their home to log on to your app and watch your movie right then and there, you'd think some more marketing would go into it. I don't know. It just boggles my mind. But yeah. You, and and that's the then that's the the story of both of these movies. Yeah. Granted, Cats Don't Dance. It didn't have to cross like a huge like financial threshold to turn a profit. I mean, thirty million dollars is chump change. I mean, yeah, thirty million dollars isn't chump change, but you could do like pretty minimal marketing in Cats Don't Dance, and you can get enough like kids in there with their parents to to watch the movie. Yeah. Right. One thing I do and, think I, I'll credit and, this movie for though. Is I think there's a little bit of marketability for kids here versus Cat Don't Dance. I can see being a bit of a hurdle. I mean, 
realistically, I think part of the reason we, again, liked it so much now is we get it probably a little bit more than an eight-year-old would. <laughs> yeah, Whereas yeah, I can give you that. The Iron Giant, at the very least, being filled with a lot of physical storytelling is much more appealing to an eight-year-old boy. <laughs> Yeah, I can. I uh, speaking from experience, this move like I have realized as an adult that I based ninety percent of my childhood on this movie. Yeah, it it is it is very influential in my life. I love this film, but yeah, and it's fascinating because this was a seventy million dollar film to make, right? And it only pulled in like twenty five million at the box office. So even without marketing, it made some money. Could you imagine if they actually did a marketing campaign how big this movie would have gotten? Do you think we would have gotten sequels out of it? Uh, good question, and I think I think you might be right. I mean, what, what? I'm just angry at Warner Brothers right now for not for not me having like a franchise of Iron Giant films. Yeah, you know, I am too. You know, uh, and I think there's a lot of questions. It's more questions, I guess, I have about it. Because this one, part, I think part of the reason that Cats on Tans had also had such a hurdle is there was a lot of development hell. I, I didn't really yeah. deal so much in like researching the development of this one. Um, um, so, the development of this movie is fucking amazing. Because it, has, it involves like The Who. It involves like a 40 year like... like trying to get it made yeah. and then it it just like fucking happens in a year it's weird as hell so it's like the book it's based on a book from like the 1960s yes. it's pete townsend of the who buys the rights to get the movie made and it was going to be a, a musical using original music from the who which would have been and kick ass oh my god dude like apparently they released an album that was going to be the music for it and it's called like the iron man mm. and it's and it's a banger and he tries to get it done through like disney and disney passes on it tries to get it done through all these studios until warner brother picks it up in the fucking 90s and they're just like hey we'll make it um we got this guy we think's gonna be pretty good and they give it to brad burr and Brad Burr's like, I don't need the Who music. It's not gonna be musical. I I got a vision, and then it just gets made in like a year. Apparently, after they gave it to him, they were just like, do whatever you want. Here's a budget. Just figure it out. And they never, the producers never looked at the movie again. So that's he had all he had complete creative control, which is fucking fascinating. Terry Gilliam has been trying to get creative control on every movie he's ever made, and has been almost unsuccessful at every point. They just gave it to Brad Burr just just cuz. Yeah, you know, I, I was kind of skimming this like uh, development section of the Wikipedia page while you were telling it, and you got it to a T. Um, what I think is uh, uh, an interesting insight there is I wonder, because let's, I mean, like we just stated, it's not any cheaper than a, a traditional production. It's no. still 50 million bucks. Like, that's that's going to get you a blockbuster budget on any day of the week. Especially in 99. Yeah, that was probably... I mean, I, I can't remember what the budget for Armageddon was, which is a, a, probably a movie that you could point to being that kind of uh, late 90s, early 2000s uh, generic blockbuster. Um, well, most most movies back then were in like the $100 million range and just kind of floated there if they were like big showstopper summer blockbusters but this movie had a budget between 50 and 70 million right yeah but that's neither here nor there let's let's get back into talking about the movie and less of its development hell it had to go through sure because the story is the thing that i get behind because whoo there's some shit going on in this movie mm -hmm. right so, like, the the theme of the film, David. What what did you pull out of the film in terms of its theme? Um, I think it's kind of a. I I get that there's some interpretations to it. What I've always gotten out of it is this kind of classic version of it, where it's just about kind of childhood innocence, 
coming back and kind of snapping adults back into reality about how they view the world. Because, you know, one of my favorite lines of the movie is, and I'm par paraphrasing, so uh, take this with a grain of salt, is you don't have to be a weapon, you can choose who you want to be. Which I think is the point. It's, it's a, you a movie. You are who you choose to be. Yeah, where all of the adults in the film have been shaped by the world that they've been beaten down by, or mm -hmm. alternatively given power from. I think uh, Hogarth is a very interesting protagonist that gives us sort of the unfiltered imaginative view of the world that we all wish we could have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, like Hogarth feels like every every imaginative kid that just never never clicked with like where he lived or the people around him, right? He he is like the outsider kid. He makes a point of it that, you know, he's the skinny geeky kid who, you know, he has friends, but they're not, like, really friends, right? Yeah. You know, he lives on the outskirts of town, but his mom, like, works all the time, so he's alone a lot of it. He watches movies, he's... And he just, you know, comes up with stuff to entertain himself, because he's alone. And that makes him weird, and he doesn't fit in around with the people around him. And then, you know, a giant alien robot crashes in, then... And it's fascinating that he doesn't go on to try and rule the planet. Fascinating character turn. True. You know. I, I think that, like, that's kind of the, the key to him being a protagonist, is that his first instinct isn't to do that. His first instinct is to find a friend in this giant weapon. Um, which, you know, is, is how we I think we should all approach life, of course. Because then, alternatively, all the characters surrounding him have different views about how that happens as mom kind of being the workaholic who is a workaholic not by choice um mm -hmm. then we have characters like let's see what's what's his stupid major dingus name um kent yeah <laughs> kent who's the but you know it's kind of interesting uh side note this film i think is really good for teaching people subtext in that there's a line that Kent says that's perfect for describing his character. And it, it all has to do with the subtext of saying something little and it meaning a lot versus saying a lot and it meaning a little. Mm -hmm. um, it's during the scene when he first goes to investigate with that like farmer or workman or whatever. And mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're sitting there discussing what ate this giant girder and uh, Kent describes himself as being like, the the government wants to ensure to its people that they have a response when things that are unexplainable happen. I am the response. I think that line says a whole lot because he wants that to sound more powerful than it probably actually is. He wants to sound like, you know, he's the guy they call when, when there's no one else left. He wants to sound like the A-team, but he's a, he's a bureaucrat. Yeah, he's a workman. No different from the guy that he's talking to in that scene. Because just as he's getting like, yeah, the whole I'm General Patton out of that phrase, what that really means is you're the exterminator. You are just sent out to spray some pesticide and make it go away. Because that's what he explains. Yeah. And the rest of it is he makes it seem like he goes out to these wildly crazy things when you know when we infer that stories are about the incredible things that happen in people's lives i wouldn't be surprised if oftentimes he's sent to a farm to investigate why the cow went missing he? he's sent to he's sent to the to the farms to be like i got these crop circles out in the field and his entire thing is finding out that the kids next door were playing a prank and yeah. that's probably all of his job oh yeah because that's another favorite line from that scene is he says big things happen and big things happen in big places, which sure is an explanation to the farmer as to why this needs to be a little thing swept under the rug. But it's also kind of an explainer for why, hey, Kent, why aren't you in big places searching the, for the big things? Yeah, he's a schmuck. Yeah. And it's and it's awesome because his so the actor's vocal performance paired with the animation, he comes off as the biggest douchebag on the planet yeah and he's not unbelievable in what he's doing 
and it's and it's fascinating because you understand why he is the way he is, right? He's embodying that like late fifties like fear of the unknown. He makes a point when he's talking to Hogarth that, you know, I don't know what it is that's out there. I just know we didn't make it, so we have to destroy it. Yeah, he's the man in black. I mean, essentially, although the man, the actual story of the man in black is cooler. Not that not yeah. being the Will Smith version, but the original, which is still cooler. Yeah, that's but true. Whatever. Um, yeah, you know, it's. I think this is another. I think both these movies have a fantastic villains that kind of make half this movie because he is obviously one of them. Um, you know what kind of, what kind of power hungry, like you said, douchebag, wouldn't interrogate a kid and then chloroform him, <laughs> which is probably. So not in his pay grade. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh god, yes. I because okay. So he 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 gets Hogarth. He interrogates him alone in a barn, then chloroforms him, then tucks him into bed, nails all of his window shuts, and then explicitly tells him when he wakes up that I'm not gonna let you leave this room and I'm gonna watch you sleep mm. all night to make sure you don't go anywhere, bro. You're you're probably only getting a bit above minimum wage. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, if that <laughs> he might be a government contractor at that point. Yeah, right. I, so I think that's another interesting lesson to take out of this movie is these kind of ideas that your villains can be stupid. First of all, they can be absolute uh, ignoramuses. A good word for it. They could be. They can't. They can be competing for something in the story that your main character is competing for, but mm-hmm. also be doing it in the worst way possible, which almost makes them even more of a villain, because that's exactly yeah. what Kent does. Um, it's it's fascinating. Do you think Kent's incompetent? Like, oh, do you think he's do you think he's incompetent and that makes him less dangerous, or do you think he's more dangerous if he is incompetent? I think it makes him more dangerous because it that culminates in the climax of the movie where he calls in the bomb, which, you know, he thinks he can just kind of call it in and run away and get his medal. But the general's like, no, no, no. <laughs> you call in the bomb, you stay, and you watch that bomb drop. <laughs> You're going to die for your... Oh, okay, that's one of my favorite character moments from Kent, the general, all this, where the general, like, grabs him by the shirt and he's like, Son, you're about to do exactly what you've always wanted. You're about to die for your country. And just, like, throws him to the ground. Mm. And then Kent's like, screw my country. I want to live. And he tries to drive off. The Iron Giant stops him. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, that embodies his character. Because that's when we get, it's like, oh, it's not a thing where he's, you know, doing this out of some misguided, like, national, like, patriotism. He's just a selfish, like, asshole who just wants to be bigger than what he is. He wants the medal at the end, but he's like, wait, I don't want to die for my country, even though, like, traditionally, like, dying for your country, that's that's where you get the medal and get honored and shit. He's like, fuck that, I want to live. He's just, he's so, like, greedy and self-centered and slimy, and he doesn't come off as, a like, a cartoon villain because I get where he's coming from. He's not bad for just the sake of being bad. He's bad because he's afraid of what he doesn't understand, which is a very human fear. Yeah, I think that's a really important thing to do with a lot of your villains. Kind of, and again, similarly happens in Cats on Dance, is to kind of pull back the curtain on him. Mm -hmm. We get the curtain pulled back on Kent, we reveal the slimy worm that is the guy who has that much cynicism about the world where he thinks that there's mysteries that need to be cleaned up because it's good for the people and that he can just go around and, you know, all that. Similarly, you had Darla Dimple, who was a terrible see you next Tuesday. And, uh, you know, at the end of the film, you get the whole literal pulling back of the curtain where you see that she's been trying to sabotage the main characters the whole time. Um, Because she wants to keep her spot. Yeah. Uh, So maybe that's another interesting little lesson here is... It's really good when your villains are brought into the light. It's one of the most yeah. satisfying parts of both the movies, that's for sure. Oh, when the villains get their comeuppance? Oh, absolutely. And even even beyond that, we also have this the interesting thing going on with, like, 
Ho Hogarth's also... You, you make a note about the character webs in these movies, right? Mm. So Hogarth's, you know, he has mm. characters he interacts with, with, like, his mom, with Dean, with Kent, with the giant. And it's a very, like, there's not a lot of, like, characters, quote-unquote, in this movie that impact what's going on with our narrative, right? Um... Like, do you think the character web for, for like, this film is, like, that deep? Or is no. it just, like, it's a very tight character? Yeah, which they can be. You know, so a lot of times those things, when you illustrate them, are just four corners of a box. And it's mm -hmm. the competition between the corners. Uh, I think there's kind of a similar thing in this movie as to Cats on Dance. Fascinating how similar these are. Where you see that Hogarth isn't the one that changes, he's the one who acts. But every other character isn't the one who acts, they're the people who change. You know, I, I mean, think about how much Dean changes, think about how his mom changes, think about how, or even, the giant changes. Mm, I, I got a little fucking teary-eyed when you said it. Yeah, because... But yeah. I mean, I, I, let's talk about the elephant in the room, I guess, before we we wrap this up because a little bit yeah. we've talked we've talked about the moment preceding it but that that just taking the bomb out and just uh oh my god hmm. it that moment will be ingrained into my soul forever it is All so right? cinematically and culturally significant that christopher nolan would go on to use it in the dark knight rises he yes, <laughs> fucking Nolan stole from the Iron Giant. Uh, Christopher Nolan, you owe Brad Bird some fucking money. I think so. But, yeah, and it's it's one of those things because like it's it's shot cinematically just very well. Mm. Like visually speaking, in that moment, you understand like how the giant is just coming to it and is accepting it. He's doing the exact same thing, marrying the beginning of. Hogarth's and the Giants relationship of you stay, I go. And his last words, right? Because the crux of the movie is you are who you choose to be. Like, that's the line that's repeated. And the whole point of the film for the Giant is what if a gun had a soul and didn't want to be a gun anymore? And in that moment when he's flying up and he says Superman, he makes the choice that he is not a weapon he's a person and souls don't die they just go on and in that moment you're just like he has a soul and he's using that knowledge to save everyone he's being superman that's who he chooses to be and i have goosebumps right now and god damn it i might uh i need a moment david start talking i mean yeah dean you really do exemplify what I think it's the best part about this movie is what if the gun knew what it did. And I, again, it's just one of those things that kind of bring it back to what we said at the beginning. It's one of those things where you're like, you can't believe that this is actually a kid's film by the end of it because it's so much more than that. And I think that's what you can really accomplish when you realize that kids entertainment is still just entertainment. I think some of the, some of the best kids movies or, or even cartoons up in general kids entertainment as a, as a whole that we consumed in that kind of late 90s period early 2000s when we were growing up is stuff that didn't treat us like kids you know there's the hey arnold's there's the the uh, the I, oh my god i just got hit by that fucking nostalgia bomb dude oh I, yeah ah. Hey Arnold is really weird when you think about it because it's a story about a bunch of these kids in the inner a bunch of about a bunch of these poor kids in the inner city just growing up. Oh yeah. That's what that movie's about. I mean, that's what that show's about. And it's awesome. Or and it's like if Oh sorry, keep going. Well, I was just going to say it's like I think that that and others of course cuz it's a lot of that Nickelodeon stuff. Some Cartoon Network did this. Oh, I mean, it's Static Shock, uh, Justice League, Batman, Superman. It, to just go through the, the superhero lineup, like, Static Shock holds up to this day for me. Like, that so. shit is just gold. But, yeah, there's a lot of children's entertainment that 
when you look back at it as an adult, you're like, ooh, this was only good while I was seven years old. Oh, certainly. I mean, like, would I go back and watch, I don't know, Ed, Ed, and Eddie still? Probably, but it's not really because it's anything other than silly and funny. But would I go back and watch Hey Arnold now? Yeah, because it's going to be, like, really deep, good storytelling. And I think that's... And- I think that's overall what I really like about this pairing, is it's a good start to the month that's supposed to be cartoon month, but showing us that, hey, just because it's been drawn and flipped through like a like a notepad doesn't mean that it's still not fantastic storytelling. And I think that's the thing. So you know how there's a certain amount of nostalgia that goes into some movies from your childhood that have to kind of carry the quality a little bit? Yeah, um, my girlfriend, uh, who I do our other podcast with, the Film Club. Yeah, a lot of movies do that for her. Like she loves the Pokemon movie, and ninety percent of why she loves it is because her nostalgia is carrying that shit on its back. Mm. And I'm like, it's like okay, it's fine, whatever. Check that episode out coming soon to the theater <laughs> near you. But with these. So, The Iron Giant, I don't need any nostalgia to carry that movie. It's just a good movie. Cats Don't Dance, I'm curious with you. How much nostalgia is carrying that movie? You know, I used to think it was nostalgia. I, after this feeling, I think I can feel that it is solely that the movie is doing what it's supposed to. Whereas nostalgia would just be that, oh, I remember this when I was a kid, and I like it. You know, there was actually a movie... Um, that we there was a pairing we cut from this month, kind of for a different reason. Um, and one we of my movies. Spoil what that one was. What we were gonna cut. Yeah, I was gonna do a goofy movie. You were going to do uh, the Great Mouse Detective. Yes. So those were probably our nostalgia picks. You know, I still think a goofy movie has a good story to it in that it's mm-hmm. a coming of age story that has something to do with a father son story. But still, I think what I really like about Max's whole thing is it brings up that nostalgic feel of, like, growing up as a guy, you know? It's kind of like a... Yeah. It, it, I think that's what a coming-of-age story, story is supposed to do, is make you feel nostalgic for that time in your life. Whereas Cats Don't Dance, I think I really enjoy... Because I, I relate to it now, first of all. I mean, this is this is a story about this time in your life, in our early 20s, when we're trying to do what these people are doing. But even more than that, it, then too, it's like the artistry and emotion that the movie holds, just like an Iron Giant, holds up at any point in your life. When you, when you think about, because it, it could be Hollywood, it could be anything else. You could be trying to become the biggest, I don't know, jawbreaker, world record setter with how many licks you can get on a jawbreaker in the world. But if that's some, something's holding you back from doing that, you know, you need, just need to do what everybody else is trying to do do what you love to do which is what the whole movie's about so you know i think that the nostalgia is something that is a commodity like the pokemon movies Mm -hmm. for example uh you know but then it's transcended when you start to design your entertainment to be evergreen a little bit and like a little bit more than just a product which i think these movies do aim to do And, David, I think it's about that time for us to get to the little wrap-up section we have here. Hmm. And, you know what? That was the slide-in for our our pretentious minute there, you know, for the nostalgia carrying it. So I won't bore the people with that. But I do have the dissenting opinion about Cats and Dance that I'm finally going to break to you. Okay. Now, David. Mm -hmm. I thought the movie was very interesting, very colorful. Like, there were some good musical numbers. It was nice. It was tight. But it felt very much aimed to young children. And as an adult, I feel I was reaching a little bit for my enjoyment of it. Sure. Now, I, I, listen, I, I'll, put, I, I'll drop a little... I'll, drip, I'll drop a little citation in here. There's a, there's a really good review of this movie on the Nostalgia Critic, uh, a story YouTube channel that is uh, quite famous for its animated reviews. Look at Nostalgic, yeah. And, um, you know, it also has a storied history in other aspects, but this was before the Dark Times. 
Right. And I think one of my favorite lines from that that review is that, is it good? Eh. Is it for kids? Yeah. So, it's still good. You know, I, I it's like I get the credit. It's it's the same thing you could be said for Iron Giant. It's technically still for kids. Does it do a little bit good, better job yeah. of like making it for the parents, as we say? Yeah. But you know, I don't think that Tell Me Lies was for the kids, and I think that's why I like Cats Don't Dance so much. Still, is that at the end of the day, there's still a lot in there that is that is for people other than children six to nine years old. Yeah. I would I would agree with you about that. It's just I think I found it harder to to groove with it when we weren't in those moments of oh, this is something that's a little bit deeper than we're following Danny being chased by a security guard. Granted, I really liked the animation and I really liked how the characters moved and again, it's you know, Gene Kelly's doing the choreography here, so the dance numbers and the sequences are done masterfully. Mm. But, you know, I, I felt it was harder for me to view it beyond a kid's movie, I'll, I'll say. Like, because that's the thing. Like, because I think kid's movie is like a dirty word in the film circles, right, David? Like, you don't want to make the kid's movie, you want to make the drama, right? You don't want to make, you know, the movie for, for the five and ten year olds. You want to make the, the hard-hitting, like, thing for, like, those college age, you know, fucking fucking crazy people right yeah i don't know so I, I, think I think it's something those... trying to look at it as a normal movie i had a little bit more trouble with i'll say i suppose i mean i i certainly think there's criticism out there for that do i think it's wrong yes but well you know that's that, that's neither here nor there we can't necessarily change the past as it were um you know, I really enjoyed this week. I really this week I think was good. Yeah, this was a great first chapter in Cartoon June. I think we couldn't have picked a better pair of movies. Um, well, we got to gush about both of them for like thirty <laughs> unbroken minutes apiece, so that's probably why. <laughs> oh, sure, sure. But you know, I think we got. A, I think we learned a lot from them as well, and uh, got a lot of good entertainment out of them. Uh, so I guess now we can, we, we can move this ship right along and let's see what's coming up next week in Cartoon June. Yes, sir, because next week is going to be, well, I know we talked a lot of shit about him at the beginning <laughs> of the episode, but we kind of have to nod our heads at the altar that is your childhood and mine too, and that is the altar of Disney, because... David, I think we can we can be honest with each other is in the realm of animated feature film there is everyone else and then there is Disney. Yeah, right? I, I think that they're like we've alluded to the fact that DreamWorks has kind of made a little bit of a comeback lately. But mo for the most part there's only one uh, at the top and that is the Walt Disney Corporation of which I am a public stockholder of, so I have to disclose this, but... Uh, <laughs> he owned, he has their money. Yeah. Ugh. But, you know, I, I there are certainly technologically significant films that they have come out with, and you could probably now guess what we're pairing because of that. We're going to be pairing 1937's Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, along with way down the other end of the century in 1995's Toy Story. And this is going to be a really interesting pick because we have the movie that launched Walt Disney Studios as we know it today, and then the movie that basically revived Walt Disney Studios, and <laughs> grant it wasn't made for Disney, but it's a Disney film now, and basically changed animation from that point on. It, it's going to, these are interesting picks. Oh, yeah. I think there's going to be a lot of interesting history to delve into those. One interesting and just how story. how they impact the world. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> these guys, these two films fucking changed how you make movies after one. Yeah. But yeah. Well, until next week, Dean, when we really break down the barriers of 
how technology influenced film, where can they use technology to follow along with us so that they can listen to that? I think the best place for them to follow us would be on our YouTube channel, which is In The Frame. And that's where you can find this podcast, The Double Feature, as well as the sister podcast, The Film Club Podcast, which I do with our love with my lovely girlfriend. And there's also the secondary non-scheduled we do it when we're bored podcast the too obscure for tv podcast which all of these do different things and look at different kinds of movies and they're all a lot of fun and you can also find us on other um other social podcast media. platforms or in, oh social media that's the other thing that's the other thing i'm fucking in charge of that i forget about all the time no, uh, David, what are those? Yeah, so uh, I guess I cut Dean off at an important point. You can find us on Spotify, Radio Public, anywhere you can find a podcast besides Apple Music. Boo. Um, you can also find us on those social medias to keep along with us. We have an Instagram that is dd underscore double feature pod or double feature picture show, rather. That's dd underscore double feature picture show. As well as on TikTok, you can find us at Double Double Feature Picture Show. We post uh, some interesting little 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 tidbits, little snacks of content on there that you can look out for. Um, aside from that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, come back next week. Yeah, and we promise we'll have we'll fix the ending like spiel at some point you so it's not this don't bad. care about the ending you're probably not even listening up to this point it's fine all the information it's... is in the description below you probably went there to find it anyway all right everybody so i think that's it for this week next week we get into the disney part of cartoon june wonderful peace see ya